Several weeks ago, I had a dream about this, giving my talk. You were all in my dream, and I was telling you about my brain and how, since childhood, my brain has asked me to do things like stretch my mouth, <clears throat> jerk my head, and <clears throat> grunt, among other, other strange twitches. And I was telling you how these twitches make me feel vulnerable. So I was also explaining in my dream how I had come up with a solution to overcome my feeling vulnerable and embarrassed. My solution was to turn these twitches into sort of a strange dance. So in my dream, I was dancing. And no, I wasn't naked, unlike, you know, some dreams. <laughs> this is just how I imagined it in my dream. Well, I was laughing hard in my dream because I had asked all of you, the audience, to get up out of your seats and to join me in a dance. And only some of you were naked. <laughs> okay, don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to dance. But what if I were to ask you to twitch? The reason I've often felt vulnerable and exposed is because I have Tourette's syndrome, a neurological condition where my brain often asks me to make these strange gestures. And I shouldn't say that my brain asks. My brain is pretty demanding and rarely takes no for an answer. Stretch your mouth right now, my brain commands. No matter where I am or whom I'm with, out on a date, at a movie, <laughs> giving a TEDx talk. <laughs> Stretch your mouth, my brain says, and you will feel sweet, sweet relief. So I do. And then my brain says, yeah, I'm going to need you to stretch it again. How rude. <laughs> it's like a game I'm playing with myself that I can't win. And that's the really frustrating thing because my brain leads me to believe that I have a choice in the matter. Now, my twitches are mostly voluntary, unlike, say, Parkinson's, where uh, the tremors uh, are mostly involuntary. And... I have only uh, a more modest case, moderate case of, of Tourette's. So there are times when I can resist temptation, but more often than not, my brain wins. And that's very, very frustrating for me because my brain is me or it's more me than any other part of me. It's a very strange dichotomy that I can't quite resolve. Okay, so back to my challenge. What if I could hack into your brain? I mean, not like I'm Russia. <laughs> but what if I were like a mad scientist and I were inside of your brain fiddling with your dopamine levels, insisting, demanding that you twitch, that you stretch your mouth right now? So are you ready? Okay, for anyone here who has Tourette's syndrome, you can sit this one out. <laughs> but everyone else, I want you right now to stretch your mouth wide like a lion or a lioness. Come on. How does that feel? Does it feel weird? Does it, is it sore? Does it hurt? Okay, come on, stretch it again, come on. Okay, now I want, I want you to grunt. <clears throat> okay, you can relax. Probably some of you are thinking, oh, I wish he'd rather ask us to dance. <laughs> okay, now don't worry, you can't catch Tourette's syndrome from me. <laughs> it's a genetic thing. Mine was passed along to me from my dad, along with his creative spirit and his quest to be unique. He was a drummer, a singer, and an amateur inventor. And he was always going around the house with his grunts and twitches, and uh, he had this weird twitch uh, that I'll never forget. He would kind of roll his eyes under his eyebrows as, as if he were looking at something on the ceiling, and I would look up and there was nothing there. Now, he didn't know that he had Tourette's syndrome, and neither did I. He said that our twitches were nervous habits. So, he would then sit down 
at the drums that were set up in the living room of our very crowded house. I was the oldest of five. It was very crowded. And he would lose himself in the music. He would began thumping, crashing the cymbals, smacking on the snare drum, and he would relax, and many of his twitches would disappear. He would trade one vulnerability for another, twitches for music. Because when you put what's in here in your heart, out there, you do make yourself more vulnerable, but you also become more authentic. My first experience with feeling vulnerable as an artist came when I was quite young. I was around the age of five when I first dreamed of becoming a cartoonist. I would snag the Sunday comic section, and I would painstakingly copy Snoopy line by line by line. And then I would take these drawings to my parents and show them to them, and my mom would say, what a good job I had done. She'd pat me on the head and say that I was her little artist. And then I'd take the drawings of Snoopy to my dad, who would scowl and do that eye-rolling thing and grunt, and he had this big, booming, godlike voice, and he would say, damn it, kid, don't you know what a sin it is to not be original? <clears throat> to not be original. It wasn't until a few years later in Sunday Catechism when I learned that original sin had nothing to do with me copying someone else's cartoons. <laughs> So anyway, I crumpled up Snoopy, and I threw him away. And after a few hours of pouting, I went back to the drawing board, or in my case, to my bedroom floor. Because I wanted to prove my dad wrong, I wanted to show him that I could be unique. And so I came up with my own character. <laughs> Where were you when I was five and six years old coming up with this. <laughs> my parents saved a lot of my drawings, and this is one of the first drawings I had done of Dogi the doggy. And Dogi was my hero. I mean, he's this cool dog strutting down the streets in his cool threads. I mean, who wouldn't want to have cool pants with that orange stripe down the side? <laughs> I love Dogi so much that I even came up with a newspaper that featured him. Now granted, I wasn't the best speller. It says, Dogie will be the Betts cartoon. My dad and I were also big fans of the space program. And a few months before Neil Armstrong first set foot on the lunar surface, I came out with my newspaper declaring that Dogie the Dogie was going to be the first dog on the moon. All was well and good in my world, until my mom and I were at a local department store, came to the toy department, and there was a display of Snoopy dolls. And Snoopy was dressed as an astronaut, and there was a big banner that said that Snoopy had gone to the moon. I was devastated. Snoopy had once again crushed my dreams. <laughs> so I went home, and I put Dogi away in a drawer, and I forgot about him. But because I had created him, I had opened myself up, I had made myself vulnerable. And I didn't stop drawing, and I didn't stop twitching. After many years and many rejections and many winding roads, I finally landed a job at my hometown newspaper, the Omaha World Herald, as a full-time cartoonist. Suddenly, I had to come up with six new cartoons a week. Okay, so my, my Tourette's, when I'm stressed out, it gets pretty bad. So there were some days, and right now I just have to tell you, I have a weird twitch where I'm wanting to stare at my left foot. I don't know why. Let's all do that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so there were days when I, uh, I didn't have an idea and I would be screeching and grunting. Who knows what the editor thought? You know, what's coming, what's going on down the hall down there? That's the new cartoonist. <laughs> so I'd be jerking my head around and, and uh, but once the, I, once the light bulb went off in my head and I had my idea, like my dad, I would relax. I'd settle down and I'd be able to focus 
on my cartoon, on my drawing. Eventually, I was diagnosed with, uh, with Tourette's syndrome. And while I was grateful to finally know the reason that I had these nervous habits, in many ways, I'm grateful that I didn't know all those years before because I didn't define myself as someone with Tourette's syndrome. Instead, I called myself an artist. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to diagnose a disorder or a syndrome. And again, I'm glad to know why I twitch. And who's to say maybe it would have been good for me to know all those years before when I was a kid. Uh, I was bullied occasionally because of the twitches. But I'm convinced that if not for having Tourette's syndrome, I would not have become a cartoonist, a writer, and a musician. Having Tourette's syndrome means that I must remain in constant contact with my brain, arguing with it, making deals with it, but also getting to know its inner workings and its inner space, which has made me hyper aware sometimes and maybe hypersensitive, but that's a good thing if you're an artist. And you know what? That's a good thing if you're a human being. Eventually, after many years of being frustrated with my brain, I fell in love with it. There are those who believe in the theory that there is a neurological connection between Tourette's syndrome and the creative process. And I, I do believe that. But I will leave the science to the scientists. Still, in my experiences over the years, meeting people, many people with Tourette's syndrome, nearly all of them, or probably all of them, are creative in some way. I especially remember meeting a third grader her mom had wanted her daughter to meet me so that she could show me her drawings and tell me about the stage plays that she had written in school. This kid was really, really talented. But the mom said to me in front of her daughter, do you think my daughter can lead a normal life? I turned to the girl and I said, not only are you going to lead a normal life, you're going to have an extraordinary life. When we embrace our obstacles, we make creative connections. And it's one of the reasons I'm able to come up with cartoons like these. There's Trump singing, hang on, got a tweet. <laughs> I drew that one, I think, just right after the election. Here's one that I came up with early on during the campaign. And one more, for, uh, <laughs> one more for good measure. <laughs> it's going to be a fun four years. <laughs> now, some might say that he has Twitter syndrome, or maybe he actually has Tourette syndrome. And I can make that joke because... Look, I know what you're all thinking now. You're thinking, hey, I, I kind of wish I had Tourette's syndrome. I mean, not the Trump kind, the Caterba kind. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that I cannot give you Tourette's syndrome, but what if I were to say to you that we are all creative in some way? Yes, we might have our stuff, our challenges, our obstacles, whether it's of mind, body, and spirit. But again, when we embrace those obstacles, that is what sets us free. So I have to tell you about a funny thing that happened several years ago. I was at the newspaper on deadline, and an email popped up in my inbox, and the subject line read, greetings, earthling. I thought it was spam, and I nearly deleted it. But I'm a curious guy, so I opened up the email, and it was an email from the astronaut, Clay Anderson, who at that moment was flying a couple hundred miles above me aboard the International Space Station. Because Clay Anderson is originally from Nebraska, I had drawn this cartoon about him that had been magically transmitted to the space station, and he was writing to me to say how much he enjoyed the cartoon. I was blown away to receive a message from space. <laughs> so Clay and I kept 
kept in touch. And a few years later, when he was about to return to space aboard Space Shuttle Discovery, he got in touch with me and he said, hey, I'd like to take two of your original drawings into orbit. I was once again blown away. He said, why don't you draw one for yourself and one for the newspaper? So the one for the newspaper was easy. The astronaut and the cartoonist. One gazes upon the world while the other gazes from the World Herald. <laughs> but it was the second cartoon, the one for me, that I was struggling with. It felt self-indulgent, and I was kind of getting scared. I, was, I had a few weeks lead time before I had to send these drawings to NASA. And I, I thought, this is like my big moment, and I don't know what to draw for me. And I almost told him, I'm just going to send you one cartoon. And then I reminded myself that when I embrace my vulnerabilities and my fears, that's where the magic happens. So remember I was telling you about my childhood friend, Dogie the Doggy? Well, I reached in to the deep recesses of my brain and deep into my heart, and I made a new cartoon, and I sent him into space. Thank you. <laughs>